Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous summer day in February, the last day of February 2021, that is Sunday, February 28th, so uh, as I'm trying to do, you know, keeping my New Year's resolution that I'm actually going to read some books this year in 2021, and so while I have been concentrating on fiction. Uh, I just finished this excellent little book, somewhat erroneously uh, titled Coyote, Coyote Seeking the Hunter in Our Midst. And what this book is about is not just any coyote, but what is sometimes called the Eastern Coyote and is sometimes called the koi wolf. This is this weird kind of hybrid uh, animal that has moved in to the northeast U.S., New England and upstate New York and whatnot over the past few decades and established itself. And uh, people just trying to figure out what this is. And this is a... Uh, a school teacher named Katherine Reed who uh, moved back to uh, Massachusetts after a long absence and she wrote this book in 2004 uh, when she moved back and she found a new predator in her midst right up, up there in Massachusetts and uh, so I know exactly how she feels because I had heard about these things until I moved up to New York. Uh, I didn't know what people were talking about. So before I uh, do a reading from this book, uh, Coyote, you tell me what this is. This uh, I recorded this. Uh, this was right outside my house. Uh, this was in September going on uh, in my garden right behind my house in New York and this is the kind of animal she's talking about. Does this sound like any coyote you have ever heard? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, I have never heard a coyote that sounds like that. All my neighbors up in New York just call this thing a wolf. So, uh, in my never-ending search to find out what this creature is, uh, this is the best uh, attempt at answering the question. So we're just going to, uh, you, as I say, you can decide what this has to do with the collapse of a planet. Um, again, this was written 17 years ago, so she starts out saying 30 years ago. So about 50 years ago, people were already starting to comment that something odd was going on. Some new creature was in the hills, and it seemed bigger than a coyote, and yet was not quite large enough to be a wolf. I was in high school at the time. I welcomed uncertainty. I despaired that so little seemed changed after the assassinations and riots and burnings, after Vietnam tested all the relationships I cared about. In their wake, our options seemed more limited. What we could say and do unduly weighted. I craved some sort of shock to our sense of natural order, a phenomenon that could not be caught or mapped or explained. Had I been more specific, I might have said, and let it be unruly and in our very backyards. The subsequent rumors seemed too good to be true. A new canid had arrived never before known in these parts. 
I thrilled at the idea of a creature rising out of the very landscape we had sought to control with bulldozers and fences and street lights and dams, something that could startle us with its teeth and resilience and a howl, a howl that punctuated sleep and sped up breathing. Though I could not have fully articulated the idea at the time, I liked knowing that these animals flourished on the margins, the same edges I would soon be exploring, the outskirts and far reaches to which the gender outlaws gravitated, Provincetown, Key West, San Francisco, the far end of the park, the last beach beyond the dunes, where it was possible to see who was coming and what they might want when they arrived. The coyotes sliding into the northeast had traveled the softwood forest first, where there were plenty of hiding places under the thickly needled branches of spruce and balsam fir, and where they perfected the art of camouflage. Over the years, they became bolder, shifting from dark to light, wet to dry, changing with the forest while continuing to find refuge along the multiplying margins. Soon they were skinnying through the ragged cover next to schools and cemeteries, alongside marshes and tidal flats, in the tangle of underbrush behind fire stations and mall parking lots. Each time a logging company, development, road crew, or farmer changed the way the land was used, the coyotes accommodated, using the disruption to settle into the comfortable niche left vacant when the last wolves were driven from the region. It's a different story, this slipping in from the all-out rout of the wolves, which was fueled by the early settlers' hatred of them. From this remove, it's painful to hear the contrast between the stories of the Native Americans in which the wolf figured as a powerful fellow creature and those of the early Europeans who saw it as a frightening competitor, a granny eater, and tempter of little girls, or as the sort of fiend that could eat every member of the wedding party when their sleighs overturned in a deep snow. <clears throat> in other tales brought to the New World, wolves were known to transform into werewolves who danced and fornicated with the devil, other wolves took the shape of men until marriage, when one might disappear into the night, only to return years later, lice-ridden, hairy, and ready to resume all marital rights to his often remarried wife. Another frightening possibility was the affliction of lycanthropy, a dreaded condition which caused humans to act much like wolves. Today it is thought that this rare behavior may be a, form, a severe form of autism as seen in a child who hates to be touched or looked at and finds howling and growling far easier than speech. In the historical context of wolf hating, however, it was easy to see a seemingly uncontrollable child as possessed by the vilest of animals. Influenced by such tales, the arriving Europeans began ridding the land of both the wolves and the woods that had sheltered them. Armed with saws and mauls and axes and a hunger for enough fuel to warm their dangerously cold houses, they pushed the forest back so fast that by the mid-1700s, New England was only about 15% forested. For the next hundred years or so, the land was kept open, a naked topography except for the steepest of ravines and rocky hilltops. 
and when the hilltops became the wolf's last refuge, they too were cleared, as when Mount Mananoc in southern New Hampshire was set ablaze, incinerating every animal driven up its sides. By the late 19th century, a recession had settled across the region. Its soils were almost depleted, and the keeping of sheep was no longer profitable. Families abandoned their farms, walked away from their towns, and moved to the mill cities or to lands farther west. In their wake, catkins drifted into meadows, birds scattered fruit, and the seeds of maple and pine blew across open ground. Soon acres of new trees grew out of the earliest remnants, and a sprawl of forest crossed the region again. Then these woods, too, were cleared in a second wave of cutting driven by an appetite for the pine used in all kinds of packaging and when the advent of cardboard curled, curtailed that demand and mills in the south were able to supply cheaper pulp, the last reforestation took place, the one covering the hills around us now. And the exact same uh, is true of where I live. The 14 acres I uh, once owned used to be pretty much all cleared and now 12 of the 14 acres have returned to forest. And there's no wonder that these very creatures, whatever they are, have moved back in to Bugs in a Jar farm outside of Ithaca, New York. According to most estimates, only 15% of New England is open land today, a complete reversal of the ratio a century ago. The habitat is ideal because of the way we use it for an animal able to exploit a patchwork shaped by, by our dependence on electricity and cars. Roads were cut through the woods, right-of-ways were cleared, houses were built on secluded, well-protected lots, and long lines of electricity kept everyone connected. The coyote, or the coy wolf, whatever you want to call this thing, was quick to take advantage of the new maze of edges. It loped into northern Vermont and New Hampshire in the early 1940s. It drifted into western Massachusetts and Connecticut about 10 years or so later about the same year I was born, when people were busy having babies and acquiring all the goods of the post-war prosperity. Few paid much attention to what slipped through the darker corridors, that new presence in the cornfield, sometimes bigger than a fox in the cow pasture, a longish shape in the shadows where the garbage was stored. Then, in 1957, one was shot in Otis, a small town west of here, and the next year several were trapped near Massachusetts' Cabine Reservoir. Coyotes had come to the neighborhood, or so a growing number of people were choosing to call the new animals. They based their claims on the patterns of sightings which began in southeastern Ontario in 1920 and had moved to southern Quebec by the mid-40s. By the mid-50s, the coyote was considered common in the Adirondacks. It took a few decades longer to reach the Canadian Maritimes, but the journey eastward persisted with coyotes arriving in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia by the mid-70s and on Prince Edward Island in Newfoundland ten years later, presumably reaching both islands by crossing on winter ice. And now, of course, these things are, there's actually a breeding population of these animals in Central Park 
in downtown Manhattan. And the only thing they can figure is they walked across the George Washington Bridge. How else do you get to Manhattan? It is an incredible trajectory from the Western Plains to the Atlantic, all in less than a hundred years. It is a journey with so many clear markers, so many eyewitness accounts coming from farther and farther east, along with furs or photographs of shot or trapped animals, that it's hard to believe some people persisted in thinking that these animals were, quote, escapees. Charles Cadeau, a government coyote control expert, insisted as late as 1983 that, quote, tourists taking home coyote pups as pets have introduced these adaptable coyotes to the eastern U.S. <laughs> And while it is true that a few caged coyotes were let loose mostly from army bases, according to a state wildlife biologist, uh, and a few more re were released by sportsmen who thought the fast animals would be fun to hunt, the great majority arrived as part of a state-by-state mile by mile expansion. The new creature was clearly a coyote, or so went the prevailing wisdom, the same animal that could be seen in New Mexico or, or Arizona, according to Larry Pringle in a 1950 article, 1959 article in Massachusetts Wildlife. One had only to see its coloring, tawny gray with black tipped hairs, find its track, watch it eat or hear its cry. Yes, All right. or hear its cry. And this is a coyote expert uh, describing the coyote's cry, that well-known series of barks ending in a long quavering howl to, howl to know that all the evidence was consistent with what was known about coyotes. Uh, I, I, I don't know uh, about you, that thing that uh, I recorded in my backyard sounds like no coyote I have ever heard in my entire life. I have coyotes right here, a uh, hundred feet from here, howling at the moon at night. Anyway, uh, 15 years later, however, such confidence about its identity had begun to waver. There were too many un-coyote-like things about it, and there were no easy explanations for these deviations from type. One study found that the newcomer's feet did not sweat, which made it more like a wolf than a coyote. Other studies found it was a few pounds too large to fit into a tidy coyote category in an off-sided study comparing the skulls of very various canids, wolves, domestic dogs, koi dogs, and the new arrival, a team of Harvard researchers found that this new animal's skull was consistently larger than a western coyote's, yet it wasn't as large as that of a wolf. What it was what this new animal was, began to seem uncertain, and a growing discomfort was felt about its relatively large size, yet the feelings it provoked were immediate and palpable. When a 50-pound male coyote was shot in 1972 in north-central Maine, dozens of people drove down miles of back roads to see it, quote, like Primitive villagers gathered around the carcass of a man-eating tiger, according to John Cole, a Maine Times editor. Quote, Hanging gaunt and stiff like a large gray dog, the animal hardly seemed awesome enough to warrant the mob hatred it seemed to engender. Close quote. At about the same time, however, 
also in Maine, biologist Daniel Hartman experienced the opposite reaction. His letter to the editor described a distinct joy when first hearing the new animals howl. I was shaking, he wrote, elated. We have a new and noble predator in our state. In Massachusetts, Raymond Kopner, a professor at Hampshire College, undertook a study of the new canid with a team of his students putting out a call for carcasses and roadkill. They published their findings the same year I finished high school. It is a, quote, new wolf, they wrote in an article in Massachusetts Wildlife, quote, a new animal, brand new, our own, and not to be confused with anybody else's wolves or coyotes or wild dogs. Right here in New England in the last half of the 20th century, a new animal has arrived, wolf-like in appearance, and it is found nowhere else in the world." Close quote. And, um, well, I, I guess these things are still spreading in all the, in, in all directions. Um, it was a fantastic notion, an idea so big it could change the way we thought about everything. Evolution was, after all, not something we were supposed to see within a lifetime at least not the way Darwin had theorized it. Evolution, in his grand view, took place so slowly that not only could he not see it, neither could any of his peers, nor those searching for proof in the decades that followed. Evolution happened incrementally over thousands of generations. A few chance variations through the long process of natural selection, longer ears, a thinner nose, a more highly developed sense of smell, all helping increase a species' chance of survival. Um, yet the prospect of a new mammal arising from the land within our lifetime infused me with an edgy excitement at the possibility of what else might appear. I felt as shaken and elated as when Daniel Hartman first heard its howl. Large animals were not supposed to change in visible ways in so short a time. They were supposed to be as fixed in their shapes as were the creatures in Aesop's fables unchanged since the last glacier scraped over the land. The wolf, the lamb, the lion, and the mouse. The animals we grew up with were so well known in their habits that calendars could be composed of their comings and goings. The February day when skunks start to mate, the March moment when chipmunks emerge from the burrows, the night in May when deer began dropping their fawns. Uh, and then she talks about that for a while people were claiming that all these things were, were coy dogs. That uh, people were claiming, what's the big deal? It's a, you know, my German Shepherd uh, screwed a female coyote. So uh, they had the coy dog theory going around for a while, and more and more uh, genetic testing um, proved the coy dog. Uh, theory to be crap, uh, blah, blah, blah. Amidst all the controversy about its identity, new wolf or coy wolf, coy dog or western coyote, the animal itself 
kept on multiplying, so did the ways of responding to it with awe, with hate, with a camera or a gun, with poisoned bait or a steel leg hold trap. Evidence continued to favor the coyote designation, though enough to prove useful in aiding it enough to prove useful in aiding its survival in the East, that it was not thought to be a wolf, at least in the 1970s, meant it was unlikely to prey on deer, and this gave hunters less reason to worry about competition. The various studies on stomach contents uh, found that mice and rabbits made up a substantial part of a coyote's diet. Their hair and bones found along pebbles, pine needles, grass twigs, porcupine quills, apple seeds, fowl bone, tin foil, and pieces of such trash as rope netting. It was clearly an opportunistic predator, they concluded, a calculating consumer unwilling to waste its energy on hard-to-catch food. To one of these animals, a garbage pile was more attractive than a deer, and the ripe fruit in an orchard looked heaps easier to snack on than a flock of railed sheep. By February 1975, agreement was finally reached at the annual Northern Wildlife Conference with conclusions much like those of, of these earlier uh, reports. This animal was a coyote, but they now labeled an Eastern coyote. So that the two main terms you, you see for these guys are either Eastern coyote or coy wolf. Uh, since this was written in 2004, I, I see coy wolf uh, more and more used. David Suzuki calls them coy wolves. Uh, anyway, this was a coyote, an eastern coyote, an, animals, an animal whose predecessors had spread north and east from its original home in the southwest. According to the thesis accepted in 1975, some of the animals taking the northern route had to have mated with the last gray wolves in Minnesota or the survivors that lingered on Ontario's southern edge, an exchange of genetic material that explained the new animal's large size. And then it kept advancing in a long trek eastward a month-by-month, year-by-year journey like a wave of immigrants driven from their homeland by drought or hard times, like one of those other waves of prospectors, sure, there is more gold in the hills of carpetbaggers elbowing in after new money. And, uh... That is kind of the lead off. Uh, to Coyote Seeking the Hunter in Our Midst. And uh, the book, it's, I really like this woman's writing. Uh, Catherine Reed uh, reminds me of, well, I won't. I won't use her name. It, it, her writing really reminds me of someone whose who's, uh, writings I have shared here on Collapse Chronicles. Uh, and she weaves the story of the coy wolf or whatever you want to call this thing in uh, with a lot of other uh, stories that I can't get into. But anyway, highly recommend Coyote seeking the hunter in our midst. Whatever this thing is, I won't go as far as saying it gives me hope, but uh, you do have to give the coyote 
<laughs> some grudging respect. Uh, as I say, I have a pack of coyotes right here, and what they do is, I have an island right off here, and the and these coyotes, they just swim across the channel. Uh, they were through here this morning. They come over here. Uh, they live out on this island, and they come over here during the night and raid the garbage cans. And then at first light, they just go and they just hop, dive in the water, and swim back to their island, the little coyote island. Now those are not koi wolves. These are the uh, the the I guess now the Florida coyotes. And they don't sound anything like that big boy uh, that I played. Let's have one more listen to this uh, to this big boy here. Uh, all right. What are you? Midnight. Take it away, koi wolf. <laughs> can't wait to get back to Bugs in a Jar Farm and hear that big boy uh, howling. He was literally howling at the uh, full moon coming over the mountaintop and uh, I've, uh, I've made a pledge to myself we're gonna get a picture of that big boy this summer if some redneck has not shot him. Anyway Get out there and enjoy the howl of the koi wolf while you still can. Bye, guys.